presence of the Holy Spirit. Just as you're pouring down this refreshing rain on us, I pray that you uh, refresh Barbara's mind and heart and anoint her lips and to teach us the things, simple healing remedies that with using your natural um, things that you've provided for us, I just pray that you open up our hearts and our minds to receive this information so that we can pass it on and share it with others. And I just ask the guidance of the Holy Spirit and bless each one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good. Welcome, everyone, to our Natural Remedies Seminar. And I'm going to be going through a few natural remedies tonight. You see, the human body was designed to heal itself, and it'll heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And there's a little book that I often use. It's called The Ministry of Healing. And there's a chapter in there called The Physician, The Healer. And it's not just for the physician. It's actually for all of us, because we should be our own doctors. And it says in there that nature's process of healing and upbuilding is gradual and the impatient, it seems slow. And it says that when you give the body the right conditions, it will start to heal itself. And something else it says is that we need to have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. One of my favourite pages is 127 of, of this book, and it's in that chapter, The Physician, the Healer. And it says in there that in case of sickness, three things should happen. Number one, the cause should be ascertained. Wrong conditions changed or unhealthful conditions changed. Wrong habits corrected. And then the fourth one is, then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and re-establish right conditions back in the system. And that's what I'm going to do this evening. I'm going to show you some of those things that you can do to the body to bring about a healing condition in the body. My book at home is heavily graffitied <laughs> because of all the things that I've underlined in it. And what I love about this book, it looks at healing not just physically, but also mentally and spiritually and emotionally. So it's an excellent book that I'd like to, to promote. So let's have a look at some of the things that you do to, to boost that healing in the body. The first thing I'm going to have a look at is the humble onion. Now the home I'm staying at the moment, the onions are all very little. So we've actually got a whole heap of onions that we're going to use. And I'm going to show you some of the things that you can do with onion. And I'm, I'm very thankful to Onion. It was the first poultice that I ever did. I was 26. My eldest daughter was 16 months old. Actually, when this happened, I was 25. And she got an earache. And because I've been trained as a nurse, and I was interested in back to nature, being a hippie, but I didn't know what to do when the child was sick. So I went to the doctor. The doctor put Emma on antibiotics because everyone said, don't play with the ears, she'll go deaf. Do you know, we should never make decisions on fear. We should make decisions on fact. So, of course, I thought, I don't want my child to go deaf. So I went to the doctor who put the child on antibiotics because he said she had an ear infection. So within about 24 hours of being on the antibiotic, the, the earache settled down. The course lasted for five days. Within 24 hours of stopping the antibiotics, the earache came back. I didn't know what to do, went back to the doctor. Six weeks later, four courses of antibiotics later, the earache comes back. Now what's the definition of insanity? To do what you've always done and expect different results, but I didn't know what else to do. I was ignorant, as so many are. So I went back to the doctor. He's writing the fifth course of antibiotics, and I was really challenged. I said to him, one question, will my daughter be on antibiotics for the rest of her life? Am I coming to that conclusion? He was challenged by my question. So he said, hmm, I'll give you a referral to an ear, nose and throat specialist. I went to the ear, nose and throat specialist. He looked in Emma's ears, he looked in Emma's mouth, he said, the child's teething, give her these drops to keep the eustachian tubes clear. That was it. You see, our eustachian tubes are tubes that connect our eyes, our nose, our mouth, our ear, 
I have since learned that wheat and dairy and refined sugar are three of the main causes of earaches in children. Let's fast forward. Two years later, child number two is about the same age. Child number two gets an earache. I do not go to the doctor. I went to the old lady next door. I was about 26 by now and she was 86. I said, what did your mother do when you had an earache? She said, mum would steam up an onion on the stove. So I went home, I steamed up an onion in the stove. When it was all soft, I wrapped it in a cloth. I put it on James' ear. James fell asleep. James slept for two hours. What does that tell you? He's not in pain. James woke up happy. All day, I'm following him around. I can't believe it. <laughs> I can't believe it. Four courses of antibiotics, six weeks, and a two-hour onion poultice. No wonder that experience set me on the path of natural remedies. So it's with great joy I show you how to make an onion poultice. So you steam an onion on the stove and you steam it like this. It's got to have that little core there which will hold it all together. Now steam it or dry bake it. If you boil it, some of the healing properties will go into the water. So steam it or dry bake it. And when it is soft, you cut it in half. And you cut it in half so that you're looking at the rings. And what you can do when you've cut it in half, remember this is hot and boiling, squeeze some of the juice into a teaspoon now that will be boiling, but when it's squeezed into the teaspoon, the cold teaspoon of course will cool it, and you can put that into the ear. And then you will wrap this up, and you can wrap it up with a, a, a tea towel, or a hand towel, a cloth, or maybe even a chucks. Now most onions are a bit bigger than this, <laughs> usually I would do an onion that would fit your ear. And so you, you wrap it up until you can bear that temperature. And then that surface area there, you would put straight on the ear. And then you cover it with a piece of plastic. What did they do before plastic? A square of wool, and you certainly, you're in New Zealand, the land of sheep. You can certainly use a square of wool. And then you might put a beanie on, you call those beanies, those little woolen hats, or you might bandage it on, or sometimes the person might lay down with that into the pillow. You see that? But you, if you can keep it warm, you keep it on. So as long as you can keep it warm, you keep it on. Now what will the onion do? The onion is a drawer, and it will draw the inflammation, reduce the inflammation. It'll break down um, any pussy areas and that can be taken away from the, through the bloodstream. Sometimes it will do just that. It will reduce the swelling and that will be taken away through the bloodstream or sometimes the ear will make a hole and the pus will come out through there. Don't worry if that happens because if the body makes a hole in the ear, it'll easily heal and how else does the pus get out? Now if someone pokes a sharp instrument and makes a hole in your eardrum, you're in trouble. But if the body does it, the body knows what to do. You just got to give it the right conditions. How do you know what the right conditions are? Well, I knew this was the right condition on James because what was the result? He slept. He was in no more pain. Mm -hmm. See that there's some of your signs. The body will speak to you. So a cooked onion on the ear is one of the best things for earaches. How long do you need to keep it on? Well, as long as it takes. When it gets cold, take it off. If the earache returns in a few hours, put it back on again. <laughs> you just keep doing it until the body says enough. In fact, one of our workers, she wore an onion poultice for a week. Every day to come back, so every day she'd go back on. Who are you listening to? The body. And she would get relief. Ah, the body's going, that's what I want. After seven days, no more earache came back. Sometimes we don't know why. This lady eats and lives really well. Maybe something was just coming out from her childhood. Or maybe she had a gluten and a dairy intolerance then. And, and maybe she had a lot of earaches then. You know, sometimes we don't know why. But the body knows why. And it will tell you if this is the right thing to do. 
Now I'm going to look at a... Uh, well, there's one other area for cooked onion, and that is on a boil. And with a boil, let's say that knuckle is a boil, you steam it, and of course you don't put the boiling onion right on. You let it cool. It'll cool quite quickly, and when, it can, when you can cope with it, you put it on, and you put a bit of plastic on and bandage it on. And you might leave it overnight. You might leave it all day. You can leave it for a while, and that onion will draw it draw the waste into itself and when you take it off, often when you take it off, everything comes out. It's drawn it all into that area. So it brings relief because what you've got, you've got the heat which will bring everything to it and you've also got the, the drawing healing properties of the onion. So they're the two places that you can use cooked onion. Now we're going to have a look at raw onion and often when you cut an onion, what happens? You start crying, is that right? And that's a good illustration of what the onion does. It's very good at clearing all the eustachian tubes. So it's a good time to cut up an onion is when you've got a cold. And what you can do with a baby, you can't do a lot with a baby, obviously, but you can, if they have a cold, you can cut up an onion or slice up an onion and you can put it on a plate in their bedroom and they will breathe in the onion fumes and it will help to clear the airways. And it's a fairly old remedy that to cut up an onion on a plate will help to take the fumes out of a freshly painted room. Also, if you've got a bad smell in the fridge, obviously you must remove the cause of that bad smell. But if you put a chopped onion on a plate, it can absorb any of the bad fumes that may be lingering. Um, after the offending article has been removed from the, uh, from the fridge. So raw onion um, can be used like that. Now there's another remedy for raw onion and you might be surprised at this one. And this remedy is for a cough. Let's say someone's got a, a bad cough and I, I'll give you an, uh, a story to illustrate. I was at my daughter's house in America and she had a little, she's got a th little three-year-old boy and she put him to bed. He had a bit of a cold and we were listening and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and he coughed and you know what it's like, you just think he'll go to sleep any minute. Half an hour later, he's still coughing. So I said to Emma, get him up and we'll put the onion poultice on his feet. Because up near the face, up near the eyes, it can irritate. So we'll put it on the feet because the feet are a reflex for the rest of the body. Specifically, the feet are a reflux for the chest, the feet are a reflux for the head, and the feet are a reflux for the abdomen. So what we did was we chopped up the onion like I'm doing right now, and we got two little plastic bags. Now, James is only three, so... Little onions is good for a little one. And we put about uh, a tablespoon of onion in one plastic bag and we put a tablespoon of onion in another plastic bag. And then we put his feet in the plastic bag. So his foot, the bottom of his foot, is sitting on the onion. And then you pull the plastic bag up around his ankle and put a sock on and then put him back to bed. So what's he got on? He's got his feet in the onion bag and his feet, uh, the bottom of his feet where the biggest pores are in the whole body are sitting on the onion. Now, not one more cough. <laughs> and he'd been coughing for over half an hour. Not one more cough. Now I know you're going to be keen to try this one and it is so simple. <laughs> Does the onion burn the bottom of the feet? No, it doesn't. And he slept with that on all night and there was not one cough for the rest of the night. So it's an amazing treatment, so simple and yet so powerful. I had a lady ring me. She was about to be admitted to hospital with pneumonia. She's 23. She said, I don't want to go to hospital. I was admitted a month ago. I was put on strong antibiotics that made me so sick and it didn't really help. She said, so pneumonia is a pretty bad situation. So I said, come, we'll do what we can. We had a program on, so it was convenient. 
And I said to her, just a little tip on your way, she had a five hour drive. I said, cut up, on, cut up an onion, put half in one plastic bag, half in the other bag. Now, sorry, she didn't have to drive with the onion on her feet. <laughs> her boyfriend was driving. And I said, put your feet in those plastic bags and put a sock on. Well, she thought that was pretty strange, but she was willing to do anything. When she got to our health retreat, she was just smiling. She said, I'm, I'm in awe, she said. What that, she said, it, it lessened my tightness. She said, it seemed to open my bronchioles. This is on the feet. Very simple treatment. Now, she was with us. When she came to us, she was on Ventolin, she was on cortisone drugs, and she was on anti-inflammatories. And we did some hot and cold water fermentations on her lungs, her chest. We'll tell you about that one in a minute. And we put onion on her feet every night, and we got her inhaling peppermint oil. And um, within the third day, she was off all her medication. She started to walk up the hills with all the other guests, and she had just finished her nursing. And that was a year ago. She's now been six months a naturopathic student. <laughs> she said, I know where I'm going now. So she'll be an excellent naturopath. Now what I'm going to do now is make onion syrup. Now this is one of the best cough syrups that you can make. And it is so easy and everyone loves it. Especially when the children aren't used to sugar. Which my children weren't. I've put a layer of chopped onion in a jar and now I'm going to put approximately a teaspoon of honey. This must be good honey, it's very thick. And you know the best honey is thick honey. So that's about a teaspoon of honey. Now another layer of onion. Another teaspoon of honey. Needs two hands. Now by the end of this evening, a syrup should have formed. Can you see what I'm doing there? Now I'm putting another layer of onion. Now because I don't want to spend another five minutes peeling and chopping another onion, this is all I'm going to do, but you certainly can fill your jar. So another... I'll put an extra dose up on, we'll put maybe two teaspoons of honey on the top. And I'm glad we've got this thick honey, because all honey should be like that. Do you know a lot of honey has got glucose syrup in it, which is just sugar water. So whenever honey is thin and runny in the winter, get worried. <laughs> it's got sugar in it. And my children used to put honey on their porridge, and you know they dig it out like candied honey, but as soon as it goes in the porridge it melts. So can you see that? It's a great illustration because the honey's quite dark. Now that honey's just sitting there with the onion, but in, in about an hour you'll see a syrup formed. Now this is a cough mixture, and if someone's got a bad cough, they can have a teaspoon of that three times a day, or a child could have a half a teaspoon three times a day. So if your child's coughing very badly, Give them a teaspoon of onion syrup, chop up the onion in two plastic bags, wrap it on their feet and put them to, get, to bed. You sh they should and you should have a nice sleep that night. So that's another thing that you can do with the onion is the onion syrup. Now a member of the onion family is garlic. And garlic is a very powerful antibiotic. But if you want to use it as an antibiotic, you should take four cloves a day. That's quite strong. So here's a clove of garlic. And how you can take it when a person's got a bad cold is as a flu bomb. So I'm going to write the recipe for flu bomb up here. So flu bomb. And when you taste it, it'll seem like you've just drunk a bomb. Garlic. Now. Someone loves garlic, they might have two cloves, but approximately one clove. 
And if I was doing it for a child, I'd use a very tiny little clove, and that's crushed. The next ingredient is ginger, and we'll be talking about ginger this evening. And this is about a quarter of a teaspoon, and that's finely chopped. So they're the first two ingredients in the, th in the flu bomb. The third ingredient is the juice of a lemon. It's usually one lemon juice. And the next ingredient is honey, and usually one teaspoon. The next ingredient is eucalyptus oil. Or you can use tea tree oil, one drop, that's it. And the next ingredient is cayenne pepper. And we'll be talking about cayenne pepper later this evening. And I'll just leave that one free because for some people it's a light shake. For other people who are very brave, it might be half a teaspoon. So I'll just leave that one up to you. Now all of these things are put in half a cup of hot water and then you drink it. Now you don't have to chew up the ginger and the garlic, you just throw it down. And if a person's got anything from pneumonia to bronchitis to asthma to um, the flu to sinus problems, any respiratory problems, that will bring relief and it usually brings relief for about four hours. So my suggestion is if you have such a complaint that you have three or four a day. And it's usually best with a meal because if you put all that <laughs> heating herbs onto a raw stomach, cast iron stomach wouldn't hurt, but a tender stomach might feel a little bit sore. So you might have that before you have a nice big bowl of hot steaming soup, which is very nice, a thick soup when you've got a cold. So that's the flu bomb. Now you can't give a flu bomb to a baby, can you? So what can you do when a baby's got a cold? When a baby's got a cold, you can wrap the garlic on the bottom of their feet. And how you do this is you finely slice the garlic. Now when my children were little, we lived in a place called Dora Creek. And our yard backed onto a swamp and my children used to get a lot of chest colds. So I was always doing little things to them. Do you know, we moved from Dora Creek and there were no more chest colds. So you do have to look at why if a child's continually getting a cold. It might be an allergy to a food or it might be living in a damp house. You know, mold is a terrible cause for respiratory problems. So can you see what I've done here? I've, um, I've put the two fine slices of garlic on the cloth and then I put the piece of cloth over it because I don't want that garlic on the, on the baby or the child's feet because it will cause a blister. Onion will not but garlic will. But if you put that cloth between the garlic and the baby or the child's feet it, it will not blister the feet. And then let's pretend that this hand is the child's foot. Then you just bind this cloth around the foot, so the garlic's on the bottom of the foot. And then you put their sock or their little booty on and uh, you can leave it there all night. Within about four minutes, you'll smell the, the garlic on the baby's breath. <laughs> Again, biggest pores in the whole of the body and on the soles of the feet. So you can often use the soles of the feet to get medicines into the body. Now my little son James, well he's 38 now and he's certainly not little anymore, but he particularly used to get chest colds. So I would put this on his feet in the morning, put the sock on and put his shoes and socks on and he'd run off to play and every step he takes, what's happening? <laughs> he's pressing that garlic in and little by little, when you slice it, it allows the garlic juice to go in little by little. If you were to crush it, too much juice would come out, that's when the blister could, could form on the soles of the feet. And if a blister does form, it's not a big deal, it'll heal, you just can't put any more garlic on till the blister has healed. 
Now, at the end of the day, when I gave James a bath, I would take his shoes and socks off and take this little bandage off, and the garlic looked like dried out bits of yellow leather. There was no more juice in it. Now, now the body knows what to do. In Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. So you put garlic on the bottom of a child's feet, the garlic juice and the actives will get into the blood and the body knows straight where to send it, where there is a need. That's the beauty of herbs. They work with the needs of the human body. Science calls it synergism. Now we're going to have a look at ginger. Ginger is one of the best anti-inflammatory herbs that we have. Probably on equal to it, especially internally, would be turmeric. And earlier in the week I talked about taking high-dose turmeric, say capsules, as an anti-inflammatory if someone has inflammation in the body. And we've had some great results with that. But what I want to show you tonight is how you can use the fresh ginger. Now you can use the fresh ginger internally and externally. Internally you can grate it on a very fine grater and then you put it in a little teapot, pour boiling water with it and it makes a delicious ginger tea. Now that ginger tea can to be given to someone regularly if they do have inflammation. I guess the beauty of taking the turmeric capsules, you can get really high dose at once. You can also give it to a person if they're cold. Now when I was in Bali um, a couple of years ago, whenever you have a massage, they always give you a cup of ginger tea <laughs> straight after the massage. By the taste of it, it's got a little bit of sugar in it as well and I don't advise that. I actually think that it doesn't need uh, sugar because it's such a, such a sweet bitter is the ginger. Now, so internally it can be used to warm up the body, it can be used to reduce inflammation, and it can also be used to settle the stomach. If someone has nausea, upset stomach, you give them a ginger tea and it will relieve their nausea. It can be great if uh, a woman's having uh, morning sickness, but you might all like to know this very important point. Morning sickness is a magnesium deficiency. And some women suffer for months and months. So all they need to do is get magnesium. <laughs> Take even four doses a day. So morning sickness is a magnesium deficiency. Meanwhile, waiting for the magnesium to kick in, which should kick in fairly quickly, you can give them some ginger tea to relieve the nausea. So that's how you can use it internally and you can use it externally. Now where ginger is particularly helpful is in joint inflammation. Now in a minute we're going to look at another vegetable that you can use for tissue inflammation, but this is specifically joint inflammation. So this will be, say, a sore lower back. It can be uh, arthritic pain. Um, it can be... Um, arthritic pain or gout pain can be used for any inflammation in the joint area. And how you make it is you would get a, a cloth or you can get a chucks. And what I do is I fold over glad wrap a few times and then I put that down and put the cloth on that. And then you grate it. I don't peel it. If it's dirty, you'll need to wash it. And then you grate it on a fine grater, and this is also a great way to do uh, the ginger tea. One of my favourite recipes for breakfast, which I might have about once a week, is scrambled tofu. And I crumble up the tofu, and I've got a grater that's got a handle and then a really little grater handle, and I just put it over the saucepan and I grate the ginger and the garlic <laughs> straight in. I put some turmeric, oil, salt and herbs and it's delicious. So of course you can use uh, ginger in all your cooking. It's great in your legume dishes. I know that Indian cooking use it a lot in their dals and it can also help with the digestion of, of the legumes. But as I showed you earlier in the week, most people don't rinse their legumes enough. You've just got to remember that the water you cook the legumes in 
is dirty water and that has to be washed away. So I'm just putting, getting this grated ginger out of my grater. And I'll hold this up so you can see. So there's my grated ginger. So on such a fine grater, it's like a pulp and you can spread it out. So you spread it out. Now I'm just saying, let's say this is for a, uh, a sore lower back and a lot of people have sore lower backs. And what we have to do is we have to listen to our body. If you're doing something and your back's a little bit sore, you've got to stop. <laughs> Many backs get sore because people keep doing things when the body says stop. And a lot of people don't lift things with their thighs. You should never lift with your back. You should lift with your thighs. So if your back is straight and your knees are bent, you will lift with your thighs. So you've got to look after those backs. So what I'm going to do now, and I'll do it up here so you can see, I'm going to pull one side over and then pull the other side over. I just need a few more pairs of hands here. So what I have done is I've made a little parcel, you see that? And the area that only has one layer is the area that's going to go on the sore knee or the sore elbow or the sore wrist or the, uh, or the sore back. And notice when I make my poultice, I've got about a centimetre all the way round of plastic. And that will just help so that the, the moist the moist ginger juice isn't going to soil the sheets or the clothes or whatever. And then I'll, um, Amelia, could you come up and I'll demonstrate on Amelia how I'll put it. Let's say Amelia has got a sore elbow. Okay. So let's say her joint here is sore. I'll put it on like this and then I'll wrap it on with a bandage. Now what will happen is if there's inflammation in that joint, that now you make sure you don't have it too tight to strangle the limb and you also don't have it too loose so that it'll fall off. It's very important that you take a lot of effort to make sure that poultice is well covered with the plastic and it's bandaged on properly because there's no fun bandages falling off, poultices getting all through the bed, there's no fun at all. So let's say Amelia's got a sore elbow. Maybe it's bursitis, maybe it's tennis elbow. Medicine's found lots of names for sore elbows, but mostly they're inflammation. Now what you can do is you can tape that on with a bit of tape or you might have a safety pin or those things and that'll clip the bandage together. Now what I always do with poultices, I always ask God to bless poultices. So I'm going to give you an illustration of what I'll usually do, especially if this is a guest, and sometimes we have guests who have no belief in God, but it's very important to ask God to bless your poultice. So I'll say, do you mind if I pray for your poultice? And they usually, oh yes, they don't mind at all, see? Oh, see? And I'll say, dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for Amelia, for her elbow. Please bless this ginger poultice in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you know, I found people love you praying for them. Now, if there is inflammation in that joint, the skin is going to get very, very hot. It appears that the ginger pulls out the inflammation from the joint to the skin. And some guests have said to me, Barbara, my skin is burning. And I say, can you handle it? Because if you can handle it, thank you. If you can handle it, just keep it on all night. And some people, especially if they have, especially if they have uh, arthritis, the heat feels very, very nice. One lady said it was just burning me and I say, well, if you can endure it, keep at it because the heat will often go up and then ease and then it might get hot again and then it will ease. And some people get very, very fearful, but it'll never burn the skin. 
It will never burn the skin. But the fact that the skin gets hot is an indication that there was a lot of inflammation in that joint. And it can feel very nice if someone has a sore lower back. And what you can do is you can actually put it on that area. It's hard, especially with us ladies, to bandage that because we've got waist and it fall up to the waist. But I find if you've got a sore lower back, you just lay on it and often your pants can hold it in place and just lay down on your back with your knees in the air and the heat will come in. Now, if someone's got a sore lower back, often they'll put a hot water on their back, hot water bottle. Now, the hot water bottle brings a bit of relief because when you're in pain, the muscles seem to go out in sympathy with your pain and they tighten. And the hot water bottle relaxes the tight muscles and that's what feels good. But if you've got inflammation and you put a hot water bottle on it, it can increase the inflammation. But if you put a ginger poultice on a sore lower back, It'll pull the inflammation out of the joint to the skin. That heats up the whole area. The muscles relax. And of course, the joint inflammation, because it's being relieved, it is no longer sore. So it's excellent for such things. And I'll tell you a story about a man who did our program. He was a barrister from Melbourne. And in our first consultation, he's 38. He said, I'm here to stop drinking for a week and I just want you to tell me me to tell you, he said, I'm not going to stop drinking. I'm just stopping for a week. I just nodded. That's all I do, nod. I'm the scribe and I just write it down. He was a very quiet man. And um, when we got to our poultice night, I talked about how the ginger poultice can relieve inflammation. And he said, um, I've got gout. He said, I've got one little toe that just sticks up like that. He said, I'm a barrister, I have my wig and my robes on. He said, and I have to wear slippers, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> and he said, this little toe has been sore for 18 months. I nodded, as I do. I said, would you like us to try a little ginger poultice? Now, we made a tiny little ginger poultice and we wrapped it around his little toe and then I put a bit of plastic on and I put a little bit of tape. This is called micropore or leucopore and it's like a paper tape and it's very gentle on the skin. And I said a little prayer and he went to bed. Now, the next morning he was coming down the hill, he's a very quiet man, and we could hear him yelling <laughs> before he got to the health centre. He said, it's gone! It's gone. His toe was flat and there was no pain. <laughs> 18 months he'd had that problem. Now, the next day, I gave the lecture on the acid alkaline balance, which we had last night, didn't we? And in the, in the lecture on the acid alkaline, it shows that alcohol is very acid forming, as is meat. He was a high meat eater too. So in our final consultation, he said, um, <clears throat> I'm going to stop drinking. <laughs> and I'm going to greatly reduce the meat, he said. All because of a little tiny ginger poultice. <laughs> he had relief. He was so excited. So the ginger is great, remember, for joint inflammation. That's the best place to do it. Now, for tissue inflammation, potato, the humble potato. Now, the potato is very good at reducing tissue inflammation. So this would be something like a, a swollen infected finger. It would be something like a swollen ankle. Um, and sometimes you might have a swollen knee and you'll think, well, do I do potato or do I do ginger? Well, do one for a few hours, take it off and do another one for a few hours. Your body will tell you what is best because sometimes you don't know whether it's joint or tissue inflammation. And what you do is you just grate that potato. We've got a tiny little potato, but that's usually all you need because if you do too much, it becomes too wet and there's nothing worse than leaking poultices. And the lady of the house will not be happy if there's potato juice on her sheets because it's not easy to get out. In fact, our laundry lady has asked us, please don't do any more poultices at night in the health retreat. 
because the sheets were getting a bit stained. But you can certainly do them through the day. As long as you make sure you wrap them up really well, there shouldn't be a problem. So here is the, here is the potato poultice. And this would be a good size for a knee, say a sore knee, sprained ankle, like that. And you put it, you, again you make the poultice out of it. Now with the potato it's very alkalizing and when you've got inflamed tissue it's very acid. And potato is high in potassium and phosphorus and both of those are absorbed by the skin to help with the healing. So you can see again I've got an area around my poultice so that when you put it on the skin like I did with Amelia's poultice the plastic well covers it. A few stories about the potato poultice. I was um, at a friend's house here, it must have been 18 months ago, and I was seeing a lady and when she came in her little boy came in too and her little boy was about seven and he had a sore finger and I was immediately drawn to his sore finger. His finger was swollen almost twice the size. It was all red with a pussy top. I said, what's happened to the finger? And the lady said, well, the doctor says it's cellulitis. Do you know what cellulitis is? Just inflammation of the cell. That's, that's all cellulitis is. Well, that's obvious that's inflammation of the cell. I said, hmm. What have you been doing? She said he's on his second course of antibiotics, he's on painkillers and sleeping tablets at night. Seven. I said, hmm, um, did anything happen to that finger? See, the detective hat has to go on. Did anything happen? Oh, he had a blister and then he played in the dirt and the blister broke and the dirt got on the skin. It's not rocket science, is it? And of course, as soon as the dirt got into the blood, then the body reacts by sending white blood cells, inflaming the area to try and protect the area. I said, aha. Uh -huh. I said, do you mind if I try something? She said, please. I said, well, what I'd like to do is get two cups. One cup's got hot water, the other cup has got cold water. And in the cold water, there are blocks of ice. It's a hydrotherapy treatment. So I shall write this one up. So what we did, we did three minutes in the hot water and we did 30 seconds in the cold water. And the reason this works is that hot is a stimulant. Because we know if we get into a hot shower or a hot bath when we're cold, oh, it stimulates, doesn't it? It's a stimulant. But probably within about five minutes of being in a hot bath, how do we feel now? We feel like falling asleep, don't we? So initially, hot stimulates and then it slows right down. So I put his finger in the hot water, but I'm only going to put it in for three minutes because by three minutes, everything's going to slow down. And then I put it into the cold. What happens when you have a cold shower? Has everyone been trying their cold shower? <laughs> It's a stimulant, isn't it? But if we were to go and dive in the cold creek in the middle of winter, very quickly we start to slow down. In fact, in about 30 seconds, everything starts to slow down. So can you see what we're doing here? We're using the stimulating time of hot, and by the time, it, before it can slow down, we whiz over to the cold and wake it up again. And before that has time to, cold down, to cool down, we go back to the hot, wake it up again. Can you see what we're doing here? And you do that three times. More than three times can exhaust the body because this is dramatically moving the blood. You see, the blood is the life of the flesh and that finger needs more blood. And that wound, in that wound, the blood had tended to sit and pool. So bringing fresh blood in drives the stagnant blood out and when the fresh blood comes in, it's got oxygen, it's got nutrients, it's got water, it's got white blood cells, everything that that finger needs to heal. Now with the little boy, 
I had the hot water and I said, put your good finger in and tell me if you're comfortable with that temperature. Can you see? This morning we talked about the will. You've got to work with the will. And if that little boy said, I don't want to do this, I would say, okay. Can you see that? A man convinced against his will will be of the same opinion still. But I find children are easily won. I say, do you know that this will really help? Would you like to give it a try? See, you show great respect to children and they show great respect to you. And it's only when I get that nod that then I will do it. Anyway, he agreed. He was sick of this finger. <laughs> sick of the pain he was going through. And so he put his good finger on. I said, is that good? He said, yes. I said, put this one in. If it hurts, pull it out. And he pulled it out straight away. <laughs> I said, just keep putting it in. Just keep putting it in until you can bear it. And then eventually he could bear it. And then we timed three minutes. And then back to the cold. And the cold feels quite good because you've been so hot. Now, while his finger's in the cold, I put a bit of boiling water in the hot. And then I say, put your good finger in. Are you happy with that temperature? Can you see? You've got to work with the will. He nodded. After 30 seconds, back in the hot. And he could bear it a little bit hotter this time because his finger's been in the cold. Can you see that? He did it three times. And when I'd finished the three times, how long did that take? Ten minutes? He had a big smile on his face. I would say by looking at his body language, his pain level had reduced by about easily 50% in 10 minutes. Now that's quicker than any painkiller. Maybe IV morphine might be quicker. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Brought incredible relief. In fact, hydrotherapy has been used for centuries. And in the area of pain relief, there is no equal to it. And then I put a grated potato poultice on his, because he had a lot of tissue inflammation around there. And when he left, he just had a smile on his face. The mother said, what will I do now? I said, well, you can do that every two hours if he has discomfort. But I think it was something like uh, 11 o'clock in the morning. I said, maybe do it again about two and maybe do it again before he goes to bed. And every time you do it, put a fresh potato poultice on because that potato is going to start drawing out the waste and you want that thrown away. She said that when they got home, the little boy said, can we do that again? Why did the little boy say that? He had experienced it. Mm -hmm. And the mother, I think we got feedback that the mother, I think it was the next day. Yeah, my friend is here. I think it was the next day, wasn't it? She said that all the stuff came out. So I so, so did another potato poultice at about two, another potato poultice before bed, and when she took the one off in the morning, all the stuff came out. So naturally, that potato had opened the wound. Never put a knife or a, or a, or a scalpel. No, 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 let the body do it. You see, I used to work as a psychiatric nurse and I worked in the operating theatre. Brutal! Surgery's brutal. This is not brutal. This is very gentle, but it's a very powerful way to operate. Now, if I broke an arm and my bones weren't matched, I'll be very thankful for a surgeon <laughs> to reset my bone. You know, there, there, there may be a time. But, you know, there are four doctors that get me to go to their town and give these meetings because they know that if everyone had this knowledge, wouldn't that cut down casualty visits in a powerful way? They're just simple things. Do you know, if you're not getting a response, go to the doctor. <laughs> but you know, I never have had to because the body always responds. No need for that little boy to take antibiotics. No need for that little boy to take painkillers or sleeping tablets anymore. Just hot and coals and a grated potato poultice. Isn't that amazing? So simple. The mother said, what will I do with his second course of antibiotics? I said, well, I don't have any authority over your son's medication, but I can tell you what I would do. Now, I don't usually have to say anything else because that is quite obvious. <laughs> but in 15 minutes, we got more results than he'd had, had for the time. I'm not against antibiotics. They have saved lives and they will continue. But you know, most people should go through their life never having them. 
Remember, this is just life-saving that they should be used for. So the humble potato. I have a couple more stories because it's such, such the humble potato is a powerful thing. When I was living in the rainforest many years ago, when my children were little, we had a guy living on the property who was a real hippie. He was sickling the grass with a sickle, you know, the old-fashioned sickle, and he was doing it barefoot. What's going to happen next? <laughs> and it went right into the back of his heel. I heard about it, and then I didn't hear anything for a few days. And one of the guys said, have you seen Chris? He's in his caravan, the, that's where he lived, the foot's swollen up twice the size and there's this red line coming right up his leg, almost to the groin. And he was lying in bed smoking marijuana, waiting for nature to heal. <laughs> nature will heal if you give it the right conditions. I said, bring him up. And I did hot and coals. I couldn't do the hot very hot. I, 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 and when I put someone's foot in, I usually put my hand there and dip it in and I watch their face. You can tell very clearly by their face if they're handling it. And if they can't handle it, just cool it down a bit because you know that after the first coal dip, they can handle the hot a little bit more. And so I did hot and coals three times. That brought his pain levels down again by about 50%. And then I did the biggest grated potato poultice I've ever done over his whole foot. You see, he had an internal wound and it had sealed on the outside. Now that is a perfect environment for tetanus. Do you know it's horses that carry tetanus? And we had horses in the paddock and tetanus can only get a hold in the body if you've got an internal wound that is healed on the outside and not on the, ins on the inside. It's got to heal from the inside out. I said, come back in two hours. He could limp now before he couldn't even walk. He came back in two hours, he was limping. I did the hot and coals again. I did the grated potato again. But when I took that poultice off, the wound had opened. And that's what you want. You want that wound to remain open until it heals from the inside out. I think I did it uh, again before he went to bed. And then in the morning, and by the way, every time I, he came back, the red line's going down down, <laughs> down. Now, if that foot didn't go down and if that red line didn't go down, we would have turned straight to hospital. Mm -hmm. But it did. It did. And that's why I say, try this. If you're getting results, what's the body saying? Yes. If the, what's the results? The results is reduction in swelling. Results are reduction in pain. So, you, so you're looking for the body's response. The next day, the foot was almost back to normal, the red line was almost gone. He said, what will I do now? I said, just keep an eye on it, you're probably all right now. But if the red line creeps up, we just go back <laughs> to more. I said, that wound must keep open, keep an eye on it. So I just let him deal with it. I said, if you need more help, I'm here. <laughs> I wonder how long he had, maybe another week? Because he had the perfect environment for tetanus. My little grandson, he trod on a rusty nail, he's three, went through the crock, right up into his foot. He'd been playing in dirt all day, so he's covered in dirt. When they brought him to me, my daughter-in-law, he was covered in dirt. What's the first thing you do? Bath. <laughs> it's just basic common sense. I put him in a bath, and that calmed him down too. And then I got a grated potato poultice, about this big, wrapped it on the bottom of his foot, bandaged it, put a sock on, and put his little crocs on. And that's it. Of course, said a prayer over it. That night, my son William, he did another grated potato poultice after his evening bath. William said to me, he only did it at night, through the day, there was no swelling, there was no pain, so he left it, and at night he did the potato poultice. After the third night, William came to me and he said, Mum, look at this poultice. And it was the poultice that he'd had on all night. On top of the poultice, there were little shavings of fluorescent blue metal. The grated potato poultice had pulled the metal out of his foot and cleaned the metal up. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And they didn't do it again. That's it. Did he have a tetanus shot? No, he didn't. There is no need.
because his foot was given the conditions required for healing. And those tetanus shots sometimes can be quite nasty. Death by tetanus is not a pretty picture, but most of the times it can be prevented by just immediately working on the wound that is there. One more story of greater potato poultice. My girlfriend Lindy rang me. This is when we all had our babies together and I could hear her little boy Louie screaming in the background and I said, what's the matter with Louie? He's 10 months old. She said, he's, she said I, I don't know, but his little penis is swollen twice the size and he's screaming. You know, sometimes you don't know why. And, and if you take him to the hospital, what are they going to do? <laughs> I said, make a greater potato poultice quickly. See, how long did that take me? Not long at all. That's why it's good. Over the next week, make yourself a poultice box. Buy a plastic box, call it poultice box, and get your little squares and your little graters and all your bits and pieces so if there's a crisis, it's just there. And you'll be very thankful. So she put this on his scrotum, then put his nappy on, and she said he stopped crying in about five minutes. You see, whenever you've got swollen, painful tissue, the cool grated potato poultice is very soothing and that immediately starts to cool the area. Little Louie slept for a couple of hours. She said she kept going in, she wanted to know if he was all right because he was finally sleeping. He, poor little chap was probably exhausted too. When, when he woke up, she quickly changed his nappy and everything was back to normal. Now, sometimes you don't know why. He's a little crawling baby. My girlfriend was a hippie. Maybe he was crawling in the grass. Maybe a grass seed got there. Maybe an ant bit the area. It's hard to know. But no matter what the problem, if ever you see swelling in the tissue, you put the grated potato on. And for joint, you put the, the ginger poultice on. My son James he's, works out, you know, and he... He was working out too much a few years ago and his whole arm swelled up. So he remembered what mum used to do and he put a grated potato poultice over his whole arm and bandaged it up. In the morning it was all back to normal except for the, the joint there. Looks like that little one will do well with <laughs> onion on the feet tonight, hey? <laughs> and we'll give her a dose of this soon. Can you see the syrups forming? The syrup's already forming. Usually within 24 hours, it's all done and you strain it. Let's go back to James and his swollen, swollen elbow. He went to the doctor and the doctor said, that's bursitis. What's bursitis? Just inflammation of the bursa, which is the fluid around the joint. He said, take this antibiotic. James stood up and said, I've never taken an antibiotic in my life and I'm not about to start. And he left the surgery. Do you think the doctor's ever heard that? He certainly didn't need an antibiotic for that. And you know, there's a big push today to get doctors to stop prescribing so many because when people really need it, they're not working. So James rang up mum and mum said, put the ginger on. So he put the ginger on. He said it got very, very hot, but he put it on one night, reduced down half, put it on the next night and by morning it was all the inflammation had gone. Very simple things and yet powerful. Now, if you don't regularly use ginger, you can freeze ginger just like that. And you can just grate it frozen. So I know that if you have ginger in the fridge and you don't use it, it, it can mould. So that's a good tip to know that you can, you can freeze it. The next thing I want to look at is castor oil. And I've got some good news. I'm not going to advise you drink it. But castor oil penetrates very deep and it penetrates deeper than any other oil. So it can be used externally. And what it does, wherever castor oil penetrates, it breaks up lumps, bumps, congestions, adhesions. It can even break up a bone spur. It can break up tumours. I have known women have told me this, that's broken up lumps in the breast and those lumps may be cysts or even breast cancer. Now we had a doctor do our program and she'd rung me up and she said to me, Barbara, can you help me? I've got a lump in my breast, 
It's three centimetres. I said it's important that you go on the hormone balancing cream, buy some of those little panty liners, put castor oil on it and just slip it into your bra over the lump. A month later, she had the operation to take it out, then she came to our health retreat for a week to just detox. She said, an amazing thing happened, Barbara. That lump was three centimetres. I put the castor oil on for one month. I had the op, and the doctor said, you know, this is really strange. That lump was three centimetres. Now it's only two. One of the guests said, well, why did you have the op? Why didn't you just do castor oil? She said, well, I didn't know till after the op. One lady told me that she totally conquered her breast cancer by just using the castor oil compressors. Remember, castor oil penetrates deeper than any other oil. <coughs> now, to use castor oil, you make a little pack. Now, this is not really a, a um, poultice, it's more a compress. So you'll notice I've got an old tea towel here. So you can use an old towel or something like that. And I'm going to put the castor oil on. Castor oil is very thick and it takes a little while to uh, soak in. So all I do is do about a middle third of the whole area. So I don't really want to hold it up because it's going to run. So can you see how much I've put on? But by the end of the meeting, that will have all soaked in. So I say to people, when you're using castor oil, pour it in and don't touch it for about half an hour and that will soak in. Now that's a really good area to put on the abdomen. Now if castor oil is applied to the abdomen, it will heal any problems in the abdomen. So what have we got in abdomen? For a woman, um, there's the uterus. So that will penetrate and break up fibroids in the uterus. That will penetrate and break up cysts on the ovaries. That will penetrate and soften the colon if the person has constipation. That will penetrate into the colon and heal the colon if the, if the person has bad diarrhea. Remember Psalm 104 verse 14? God gave herbs for the service of man. So whether it's diarrhea, irritable bowel, or whether it's constipation, the castor oil will go in and it will penetrate very, very deep and it causes a cleansing and a healing in that area. It's a remarkable herb. So you can use it to break up um, gallstones. So you would put it, say, on the liver area under the right rib. You may put it at the back to break up kidney stones. I've known people that have had bone spurs, say on the knee, and they'll apply the castor oil compressors. We had a lady do our program, she had bone spurs on both knees. <laughs> and she also had tumours in her abdomen. After doing our program, it's two years now, and both Two tumours have totally gone. Her oncologist can't believe it. So she had a total lifestyle change. And she was doing also the castor oil compresses on the knees for her, knee spur, her bone spurs on her knees. She said after, I think it was six weeks, they'd, they'd gone down by half. She said she forgot to do it. And she noticed a, a month later, they were gone. <laughs> Now, last night we looked at the acid-alkaline balance, and it's a high-acid diet which causes these um, deposits of calcium on the bones. So she also changed her diet so that she was not having a high-acid diet anymore. So the castor oil, I've also seen it help people with brain tumours, and what they do is they put it on the area. Remember, it'll penetrate very, very deep, break up lumps, bumps, congestions, adhesions. So if you've got a sore knee and you think, well, do I use the castor oil, do I use the ginger, or I do use the potato? We'll do one one night, one another night, one another night, and just see what the body says. And your body might like them all. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine because they're doing slightly different things. So it's very powerful. It'll break up a bone spur, but it will not break up your bone. Why won't it break up the bone? 
Because remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. They work with the needs of your body. So the castor oil can be a very important part of a program on something like, well, anything that I have just suggested. Now that's already um, soaking in quite well. Can you see that? Now because it's a compress, this can be reused again and again and again. So a person might use it a dozen times. Now if someone's using it for, let's say, a fibroid on the uterus, in the uterus, they might wear it overnight. Or some people say, well, I don't like wearing it overnight. So I say, well, just wear it for at least five hours a day, for at least five days a week. Little by little by little, it'll penetrate and start breaking up any unnatural growths in the area. One lady said that it felt so comfortable on her lump in her breast, she just wore it 24-7. <laughs> And that's where you can devote a sports bra to this. Now, every time, let's say someone wears it overnight and they're going to wear it the next night, they might put another little teaspoon in. You'll get to know when it starts to dry a bit. And one person said, well, can't I just rub the castor oil into the area? You'll just get a light layer then. And any clothes you put on it are going to get castor oil on them and that is no fun to get out of your clothes. But with this compress, it's a vehicle. It's a vehicle to hold the oil. And the thicker the compress, the more oil it can hold and the more oil is available to go into you. Now an old bush remedy in Australia is if you get something in your eye, put a drop of castor oil in your eye and that'll roll around and even take it out. And another recipe, I have not used this, but I have had people testify for glaucoma and cataracts, put one drop in each eye before you go to bed at night. That's the only time you do it, because you'll go a bit blurry. But because you're going to sleep, it doesn't matter. One lady said, I'm about to have an op, what'll I do? I said, well, put the drop in each eye and see what happens. And if it's too advanced to basically have a turnaround, maybe you'll have a knob. But personally, I think it's worth the try because <laughs> you just might be able to prevent a knob. Eye surgery's come in a long way and it's not a difficult operation, but it's, n it's nice if it can be, be prevented. So the castor oil can be used in a variety of areas. What I'm going to look at now is charcoal. Now charcoal is also a drawer and charcoal can penetrate very deep into the into the area drawing but castor oil is unique. We talked about the drawing powers of potato, we talked about the drawing powers of the onion but where charcoal is unique it will absorb and neutralize poisons. Nothing else will do that. And in hospitals today, they use charcoal for poisoning cases. One girl said to me, I had an overdose and they gave me a choice to have my stomach pumped out or take charcoal. She said, I chose the charcoal. <laughs> so charcoal absorbs and neutralizes poisons. So it can be used internally and it can be used externally. Now charcoal doesn't have a taste. And you can use it if any poison has been ingested and it can also be used if a person has diarrhea or um, gastric or bloating. The charcoal, when it's taken, will absorb and neutralize the poisons and can bring a lot of relief. So if ever I had a baby that had a bit of diarrhea, I'd give them a bit of charcoal. And when I got the black nappy, because <laughs> I didn't use disposable nappy, I knew that my baby was well because once that charcoal goes through, it absorbs and neutralizes the poisons. So you can use it internally and you can use it externally. You use it externally, again, for cases of poisoning. So it can be used for a bee sting, a uh, ant bite, a snake bite. You don't have many snakes here. Hmm? <laughs> we have a few in Australia. Spider bites, do you have spiders? Oh, maybe we don't need to talk about the charcoal. 
<laughs> wasps, <laughs> bees, any sting, um, it, it's quite incredible. You almost have to experience it to believe it, that it takes the pain out straight away. And the reason it takes the pain out is because it absorbs and neutralises the poisons. In fact, under a microscope, um, charcoal has lots of little facets and it's all those little facet or surface areas that, that absorb the poison. Now, how do you take it? You can just mix it with water and drink it, like drinking black water. Again, it has no taste. Or to use as a poultice, you have to put it with something because mixing charcoal and water is like mixing dirt and water. So for a poultice, you could mix it with a bit of flour, you could mix it with a little polenta, but two that most natural therapists would use would be ground linseed. So ground linseed, when you pour boiling water on it, it goes like a jelly. Or what I have done is I've put linseed in a saucepan with water, I've cooked it for about five minutes and it goes like a jelly. And then you would add the charcoal to it. And that makes a very nice poultice, especially if someone's got a boil or a, uh, a wound. It's, it's very good on boils for uh, ingrown toenails, things like that. You could use potato or you could use this. Whenever there's pus in an area, I like to use charcoal because it'll absorb and neutralise the poison. So the other thing that I use is slippery elm. So let me take a moment to talk about slippery elm and then I will show you how to make the poultice. Slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And when you put water with slippery elm, it goes like a thick jelly. Now slippery elm has a growth stimulant in it. So it's excellent for healing the gastrointestinal tract. I talked about it earlier in the week. So when you put slippery elm with water, you would put about a teaspoon with about half a cup of warm water. You have to mix very well and drink it down or it'll go very thick. So if I have a guest who maybe has some diarrhea and um, sore gut, I'll say, are you ready? And when they nod, I mix it, mix it, say, drink, drink. <laughs> if you mix it and put it down, it'll go thick and then you're eating it with a spoon. And one man said he doesn't mind eating it with a spoon. Well, he can eat it with a spoon if he wants. But most people would prefer to drink it down before it goes too thick. I'm going to show you how to make a, a slippery elm and charcoal poultice. Maybe this is for a bee sting. So I use about a teaspoon of slippery elm. And see, it's like a powder. And then I'm going to use a teaspoon of charcoal. You never want to drop this jar. So I use about the same amount. You always put the lid back on the jar very carefully. When I was in the rainforest, I just used to use the charcoal out of the fire and I would blend it or I would... And if I did blend it, I couldn't open the blender for about half an hour. You have to wait for it settles down. Or sometimes I put it in a bag and get the rolling pin and crush it. But now that I'm civilised, I buy activated charcoal. And it's a, f a nice, fine white powder. Sorry, black powder. Fine powder is what I meant to say. And um, it's, it's a lot easier to drink or use because there's no lumps in it like my rainforest charcoal. But it does the same thing. Activated charcoal is a little bit more potent. They slowly, slowly combust it and put a fine moisture, a layer of moisture over it and it activates it so it's a bit more potent. But any charcoal will work. So I have got here, I think you can see it, I don't want to tip it too much, is I've just mixed the charcoal and the, the slippery on and now I'm going to put a bit of water. I'm not sure how much, put a little bit of water in it and if it's too thick, add a bit more water. If it's too runny, then add a bit more slippery elm so you play with it. And what I'm aiming is that this mixture here will be lo almost like a lump of jelly. So I'm mixing, mixing, and I shall put it in a poultice in a minute and you will see it. And this is quite quick to, to mix up. I was 
gardening one day and a jumping ant bit me. Jumping ants are very, very painful. Jumping ants, it feels like there's a knife gone in. And I was so busy gardening, I, I didn't, um, didn't want to stop and make a poultice, so I just grabbed a bit of ice and put it on it. And of course, that'll stop all inflammation. And as soon as the ice had melted, the pain came back with a vengeance. And I did this three times, and then I realised it was going to be much easier to just go in, make a poultice, put it on my finger, and go back to gardening, which I did. And when I put the charcoal poultice on, all the pain went. It just, just goes like that. It's incredible. And I just kept that on my finger all afternoon. It's almost you wonder if you really did get bitten because it just takes it away. Now, can you see the, the, the uh, consistency I've got? And that's basically the slippery elm that's giving it that, that consistency. And so now I'm going to make it into a poultice. So I'll put the plastic down and I'll get the chucks. And you might see this going into the poultice. So can you see like it's like a lump of jelly. And one of the beauties of that is that the slippery elm is also a drawer. And it's the same with the linseed. It is also a drawer too. So you've got a double whammy effect. And you spread it out. I'll hold it up and show it to you. In fact, it's almost like you're spreading it like peanut butter. Can you see that? And the beauty of the slippery elm is it really is just holding it in place. And then you fold over like you did the other poultices. And you can see that that's one of the beauties of the, of the chucks. It's starting to come through the holes already. Now where would I use this? Again, I would use it on a snake bite, an ant bite, a bee sting, a uh, wasp bite, any poisoning cases. But you can also use that on a sore eye. That will bring a lot of relief to a sore eye. And you can also use it on, um, on a boil. And again, as I mentioned before, any case where you've got swollen and you've got pus, and you might say, well, wouldn't you use the grated potato? You certainly could. You might do grated potato one time, and you might do the, uh, the charcoal another time. But wherever you've got any poisoning or pus, that's where you would use the charcoal because of its ability to absorb and neutralise the poisons. So that's the charcoal poultice. So you're starting to see that it's a good idea to have a little jar of charcoal in your first aid kit. We'll just have another look at the... Can you see the syrup forming now? It's still a little bit thick in the bottom because it can take 24 hours before it's fully syruped. But if you had a, someone that had a bad cough, you could have, use a little bit of that straight away. Now we're going to have a look at cane pepper. This is my travelling pack. I take cane pepper everywhere with me. Cane pepper is a remarkable herb. Cane pepper is not chilli. Chilli comes from the chilli family and cane pepper comes from the capsicum family. Chilli is an irritant to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. Black pepper is an irritant to the lining of the gastrointestinal tract. But cane pepper will heal a stomach ulcer. Cayenne pepper moves blood. It's one of the best circulatory stimulants there is. It's not a nervous system stimulant like your caffeines or your tobacco. It's a blood stimulant. And when you consider that the life of the flesh is in the blood, cayenne pepper is a wonderful healer. And you can put cayenne pepper with any other herb and it'll intensify its action. So let's begin by looking at how you can use cayenne pepper internally. By the way, how would you take it? Well, a medicinal dose may be a quarter of a teaspoon in a little bit of water and throw it down. Won't it burn? Well, I prefer to call it tingle. <laughs> 
It might feel like it's burning, but it will never burn. I have a book at home by Jethro Kloss called Back to Eden. He devotes half a page to every herb except for cane pepper. Ten pages he devotes to cane pepper. It's a remarkable herb. And I think I mentioned this the other night. You can get an e-book. It's called Curing with Cain by Sam Beiser. And you can download that book. The whole book is on cayenne pepper. It's a remarkable herb. So let's have a look at internally. Internally, it'll heal a stomach ulcer because what the cayenne does, it causes a constriction of any open blood vessels. So just for a moment, let's look at externally. If you have a cut, cut, you pour cayenne pepper into it and it'll stop the bleeding. Now we had a Fijian doctor come over and work with me for a couple of weeks. She wanted to look at what we did. Do you know she works in Suva now and her name is the uh, nutritional doctor. She, she works all with natural medicines. But let's back to, to uh, Misty Mountain. I'm giving a lecture and I heard a crash in the kitchen but I just kept lecturing as I always do. Like when the little girl does ballerinas there, I just keep lecturing. I just keep lecturing. Yes, the building might fall down and I just might keep lecturing. That's my job, <laughs> just keep lecturing. I was in the Bronx, New York lecturing one day and behind everyone, a policeman came in with his gun drawn. I just kept lecturing. <laughs> <laughs> he went out again. <laughs> so the good news, we're gonna keep going. Anyway, um, where was I? Where was I? Misty Mountain, and we've got the doctor. Crash in the kitchen. Found out later the blender had dropped, and she had bare foot, feet as Fijians do, and you know how thick blenders are? Three bits of glass had gone on the top of her foot, and she had three one centimetre long cuts on the top of her feet. And the staff were saying, Barbara, Barbara, quick. So I went outside and just like most Fijians, she's laughing. <laughs> and I looked at her foot and I could see little globules of fat. How deep is that? That's very deep. I said, don't worry about it, we'll fix it. So I went and got the cayenne pepper and I sprinkled cayenne pepper in it. Anyway, she laughed the louder, as Fijians do. <laughs> most others would have screamed. <laughs> Doesn't it hurt? Well, it's already hurting. So it just hurts a little bit more. <laughs> and only hurts momentarily. It's like when you put cayenne pepper in your mouth, it, it, the tingle dies down. And then we bound it up. Well, I saw her the next day and she said, I can't believe this. She said, I would have stitched that. She said, if I'd been near a hospital, she said, I would have stitched that. But she said, this has drawn it together. She said, all the swelling's gone down. She said, it's unbelievable. So you see, her experiences with, at Misty, maybe that one, <laughs> was very helpful on her knowing how to treat. And that's what Cain will do. My son William, when he was about 10, he was clearing away the banana, the, the cut banana. You know how bananas, you'll get the old ones? And the eldest son was cutting them with a machete. And William thought Peter had finished that area and he came in just as the knife came down and cut across the fingers. In fact, the other son was looking through the grass for the fingers, but it was all right, they were still there. <laughs> anyway, I was in the meeting at a time. I looked up and saw Peter saying, Mom, and I said to my daughter, go, go and see what's wrong with Pete. And then they were all gone. Well, I finished the meeting and went up to the house half an hour later, and there's William with cane pepper all over. The kids had put the cane pepper on it. <laughs> And he was sitting there with a frozen juice ice block. That had made him happy. <laughs> Do you know that it should have been stitched probably? Well, I wouldn't have stitched it, but I'd say most people would have thought it, it should have been stitched. But it healed very nicely. Now, this little finger was bent for a while. So what did he cut through? A tendon. Now, when my brother-in-law saw that, he was not very happy because he felt I should have had it stitched. But I thought... Well, it's his left hand and it's the third finger, so what does it matter if it's a bit bent? Do you know how you sort of got a... And what would happen if he went to hospital? 
They would have insisted on tetanus. They would have insisted on, you know, the, uh, how are they going to find that time? I thought, no, it'll be right. So what I did was every time we were sitting in church or sitting in a car, I'd just rub it. I'd just rub it. And I found within a few weeks it was working again. <laughs> See, hey, you've, you've, got to, you've got to weigh up. What, 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 is this really important? <laughs> and as I said, if I broke my arm and my bones were sticking out, I'd be very thankful for a doctor to <laughs> perform an operation to get my arm working again. But there are lots of little tiny bits and pieces that the natural remedies will fix. So any cut, put the cane pepper on it. Yes, it will hurt, but it's already hurting. And remember, it'll settle down and then bind it up because it'll constrict the blood vessels and cause them to shut. Now, internally, if there's a bleeding ulcer and you take cane pepper, won't it hurt? It'll give a little bit of a tingle, but it will never hurt, meaning it will never cause an ulcer. In the book Jethro Kloss, there's a doctor that says it's impossible to cause a lesion with cane pepper. Another doctor said you cannot abuse cane pepper. It's impossible to abuse it. It's actually a very safe herb. It will never harm. It might feel like it sometimes, <laughs> but it will never harm. You can also use it internally if someone has a heart attack. Now, I had read about this, but I experienced it once, and it was when we had our health retreat in Melbourne. I got a call from one of the staff. A lady's had a heart attack in the middle of a cooking class. So I ran down. I was there in three minutes. The lady's lying on the ground. Her face is white. There's a guy holding a pulse. He said, the pulse is gone, almost. I said, quick, cane pepper. I got a half a teaspoon on a, of cane pepper, quickly put it in her mouth. She was half conscious. We are able to give her a little bit of water to, to drink. Within two minutes, the guy holding the pulse said, the pulse is strong. All the color came back into her cheeks, and she sat up and said, what happened? <laughs> Just amazing. We sold out of cane pepper, that program. <laughs> Everyone, what happened to that lady? What happened to that lady is that that cane pepper, when it got into the blood vessels, it thinned the blood. This is the best blood thinner. No need to wolfrin, for wolfrin, I mean rat poison. Hmm? No need for aspirin. And by the way, it has been shown today that aspirin causes brain bleeds. This is very, very safe with no side effects. Now, if someone is on warfarin or aspirin and they're a little concerned, I would suggest start taking a quarter of a teaspoon three times a day. And most people, if they're on warfarin, they have to be tested, yeah, every few weeks or every month. And the doctor will say, your blood's getting so thin, we can reduce your medication. Mm-hmm. Because he will see it if you're taking cayenne pepper. It's very safe. There are... I was going to say many doctors, probably 1% of doctors, there are a few that, that are using natural medicines with amazing results. See, there's no side effect with this. You could take a bucket of that a day and you would still not bleed to death. Mm -hmm. Because, remember herbs, Psalm 104 verse 14, God made herbs for the service of man. They work with the body. Now what that did when this lady took it, it thinned the blood, it immediately opened, dilated all her blood vessels and she got a dramatic delivery of blood all through her body and that's what pulled her around. Isn't that amazing? If you've got a stomach ulcer, it'll constrict the bleeding vessels. If you need to open the arteries, it'll just open that. That's how the herbs work with the body. You can also use cayenne pepper to wake up areas of the body that may be sleeping. Now, we have had a few people come to our program who've got peripheral neuropathy. That means they've lost the feeling in their feet. And this is one of the side effects of chemotherapy. So we've had a few people come who have lost the feeling in their feet. And it can also be used when people get commonly uh, cold feet. You must never allow your feet to get cold because perfect health requires perfect circulation and perfect circulation means that your feet 
are the same as the rest of your body, the same temperature. I used to get cold feet a lot until I, until I started exercising. You see, exercise is the best cure for poor circulation, especially that interval training. But we have had many people come with cold feet, and we've had a few people come with peripheral neuropathy. They've lost the feelings in their extremities. Now, if someone's lost the feelings in their extremities, you can never do hot and cold foot treatments on them. You put cold feet into really hot water, you can damage the tissues. So you have to be very cautious with that. But you can put a cane pepper compress on the bottom of the feet. Now what I usually do, now you see what I've done here, I've got a piece of glad wrap and I've got kitchen paper that's been folded over. I'm going to put a light sprinkle of oil on that and then I'm going to sprinkle about half a teaspoon of cane pepper on that. And what the person does, they put their foot straight on the cane pepper, wrap the glad wrap round, put it in a sock and keep it on all night. And by morning, their feet are warm and their feet stay warm. <coughs> I had one man who'd lost all feeling in his feet and on the second night he got pins and needles in his feet. What's pins and needles? That's the first sign that life's coming back in the feet. You see, it's very, very gentle. So usually I put olive oil and I haven't got olive oil so I'm just going to do a little bit of castor oil here. So just a little, a little smear of olive oil oil or castor oil, just enough to, uh, so that the uh, cane pepper will stick. And now I just spread that over so it's spread out. And I have put a little bit too much on there, but that will be just enough for the other foot. So I'm just going to put another one on so that, to mop it up because it's, oh yes. So I've easily got enough for two feet here. And most of us have got two feet, yes. And now I'm going to sprinkle the cayenne pepper on. So the oil is just so that the cayenne pepper sticks to it. Because if you didn't put the oil on, of course the cayenne pepper would just all fall off. Now this is about how much I put on. So you see that? and then the foot goes on that. It will not burn the foot. If I put that on my foot, and we're not going to do it in this weather, because we're warm enough anyway, but if I put that on my foot, by about four in the morning, I'm waking up wanting to take them off. My feet are getting so hot. But if someone has cold feet, by morning their feet are just getting warm. If someone has no feeling in their feet, sometimes it will take two nights before it will come. Now, if, so, if you put it on your feet every night, you're going to want to sit with your feet in ice water all day long because your feet will get too hot. So what I usually suggest, if someone has cold feet, do it about every three nights until their feet stay warm. And if someone has no feeling in their feet, even then I would probably only do it every two nights. And, of course, you wait for your result. You would stop if the person has full feeling in their feet and their feet feel like they're on fire the whole time, then you would stop. So you watch, you watch the body's response, but it's very, very safe. <laughs> That's very, very safe compress. And it can bring feeling into feet that nothing else will do. Remember what cayenne pepper does? What I like to do is I like to understand what the actives are in the herb and then you know to apply it. And it's number one most important active is it moves blood. So it's going to pull blood to the area when you've got that on the bottom of the feet. So when you take it off in the morning, you just wipe it with a, a wet washer, dry it and um, put your shoes and socks on. Now, very important to keep your feet warm. We're coming into winter. Don't let your feet get cold because cold feet drives cool blood back to the extremities, which can be, can be very bad for the health of your internal organs. You can also wake up a thyroid gland. So underactive thyroid gland, you see, underactive thyroid gland, you can put a cane pepper poultice on that or compress. And what you would do is you would just do one about this size because your thyroid gland is about there. 
and then you would put it on for a few hours. Now, we had a lady who was so excited about this because she had an underactive thyroid. She was on medication. Today, she is on no medication. It took a bit of work, but eventually she got off her medication, and that's quite a surprise to most people because most people think if they're on the thyroid medication, they're on it for the rest of their life. Her doctor took her off because all her levels became normal because of everything else she was doing. So she put it on and went to bed and she didn't sleep all night because that woke her thyroid gland up so much she became <laughs> active all night. So message from this is don't put it on before you go to bed. So after that we started putting it on just in the morning while I was doing the lecture while she was with us. And she said that after about half an hour, it got really, really hot and then it would settle down a little bit. So can you see what's happening? Is blood is being drawing into that thyroid gland to wake it up. Remember what blood is? It's the life of the flesh. If someone's got an overactive thyroid gland, students, what would you put on the thyroid gland to slow it down? Ice. That's so simple, isn't it? It's so simple. But one thing that really can help the thyroid gland to control or balance out is high intensity exercise. High intensity exercise wakes up that thyroid gland. Often thyroid glands, whether it be under or overactive, are iodine deficient. And you can do a very simple iodine test. You can get iodine from the chemist and you paint it, say, on the inside of your arm and you'll get a brown smudge. And then you just observe how long it's there for. If that iodine disappears within an hour, you've got low iodine. Well, how do you get your iodine up? You just put it on every day until it stays there. It should be there for about five hours. That's a very simple one, isn't it? And your thyroid's main food is iodine. And earlier in the week, Actually, it was yesterday, last night, I said that mercury gobbles up your selenium and your thyroid gland needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxine. And so getting the mercury fillings out is also important. You only need five Brazil nuts a day to supply all the iodine that you need in a day. Now, we're just about wrapping up now. And... Um, there's one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that's Epsom salts. And Epsom salts is magnesium sulfate. And magnesium is a, um, a muscle relaxant. So if someone's stressed out, sore muscles, can't sleep, they can have an a Epsom salts bath before they go to bed. Even put a couple of cups of Epsom salts in a hot bath. And remember, it does three things. It re relaxes the muscles, and you might do it for aching muscles. You might do it for um, if you're stressed, and you might do it if you can't sleep because magnesium and moist heat relax the muscles. But what a lot of people don't know is you can use uh, Epsom salts for a burn. It's one of the best things to use for a burn. You can use grated potato for a burn. You can use aloe vera for a burn. They're both excellent, but you can also use a saturated solution of Epsom salts. Now, how you get a saturated solution of Epsom salts? Let's say you've got this glass of half a glass of water. Put a teaspoon of Epsom salts in and stir it. It'll dissolve because magnesium is a water-hungry molecule, remember? So you put that magnesium in and it'll dissolve into the water. Put another teaspoon in, mix it. Put another teaspoon in, mix it. And you keep doing that till it won't dissolve anymore. You now have a saturated solution of Epsom salts. One lady said she always has a jar in her fridge. Now, my husband was whippersnippering one morning. This is just as the program's starting. And he came running in, and I could see by the look of his face he's done something really bad. Because he's always scratching or hurting himself, but, you know, he doesn't do anything about it. For him to come to me, it's really bad. What he'd done is he'd touched the red, almost red-hot exhort on the, um, or part on the whippersnipper, and he'd burnt these three fingers. Now, how sensitive are our fingers? And his face was white, and he was just... 
holding his finger. Now, we were busy making beds. I think one lot of guests had gone out, the other lot had come, were about to come in, so we were busy. So I got a bowl of water and I put his hand in it and then I put a few teaspoons of Epsom salts. I just said, just keep it in there. And I went and made another bed, came back, dissolved, put a few more teaspoons in and told him to mix it. And he said, it'll be right now. And he went to go and then he came running back and put it in. And as I saw later, he, he had burnt several layers of skin. It was a very bad burn. Anyway, he said, I've got to get back to whippersnippering. <laughs> so what I did, because I now had a saturated solution, I got some cloths, say, just like this. So don't throw out your old tea towels and your old towels, and your old sheets. Save them for your poultice box. And I soaked it in the Epsom salt solution. I didn't squeeze it right out. I kept it quite moist, not quite dripping. And I put it over every finger. And then I put Glad Wrap and taped it. And I put that on every finger. And the pain came back, but only about 10% of the pain. It had, by doing, you know, in the bowl of water, no pain at all. But only about 10% of the pain came back, so he could endure that. And then he went back to work. Now, at lunchtime, when he came and sat with me and we ate with the guests, he was just saying, miracle, this is a miracle. He couldn't believe it, how it had stopped the pain. It's quite incredible. He had very bad burns and they were lightly blistered, but often it won't even blister, but he had gone through just about every layer. So what I had to do after that, I just taped... Um, because it's very hard to wrap Michael up because he just wants to get going. But I just put aloe vera. I just cut a leaf and I spliced it down the middle and just taped a hunk of aloe vera to each finger because he now had raw flesh. And, of course, your skin is a protection. So if you ever break that skin or open it, you've got to put something on to protect it. Aloe vera has a growth stimulant in it. And you know if you cut an aloe vera leaf in half off the plant, you come back a few hours later, it's grown a skin. Have you seen that? That's because it has a growth stimulant. So you can use it internally like slippery on with, for irritable bowel and you can also use it externally for any wounds, for burns, it's excellent for that. And it, it helped to grow that skin very, very quickly. And I wouldn't be surprised if a doctor had seen those raw flesh, they would have suggested a skin graft. But the aloe vera grew that skin beautifully and there's not even a sign of it now. Could I, put have, could I have put aloe vera straight on it? Well, I could have, but he was in such pain, we just immediately put it in water and the Epsom salts and it was just there, so that was handy. So sometimes you won't have aloe vera, but you've got the Epsom salts. And sometimes you won't have Epsom salts, but you'll have aloe vera. So it's, as you can see by what I've shown you tonight, there's a whole lot of bits and pieces you can do, and so sometimes it depends on just what you've got available. And that's why in a crisis, students, you need that poultice box. <laughs> and I hope every home has got an aloe vera plant it's good to have these bits and pieces there. Are there any questions before we close? Yes. Sorry. Sorry? Pardon? Yeah, we do have a video. It's a poultice, a poultice DVD. Um, I've probably gone a lot further than on the DVD, but the DVD has everything that you need. There's a question back there. What is slippery elm? No, it grows in America. It's the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree, but, but you will find most health food shops have it because it's such a well-known herb. And I think every home should have the slippery elm. It's an excellent herb. Yes? Yes, you can use it for Raynard's disease. Remember, it's very, very safe. It's very safe. Might not feel like it when you have your quarter of a teaspoon down the hatch, but it settles down very quickly. Yes? Have you heard of urinating on a burn? Have I heard of urinating on a burn? Well, it wouldn't surprise me because of the minerals in urine. Yep, so that is something you can do if, you, if there's nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> 
but your children probably won't let you do it. <laughs> but if they're in pain, they'll probably let you do anything. There's a hand up the back. How much came pepper in the, bomb? in the flu bomb? Well, some people are brave enough to have half a teaspoon. If I was making it for a child, I'd put a light sprinkle. So I didn't put it there because it's whatever you can handle. There was another question, yeah? Just when we're using the car for oil, we don't actually, we just use it straight. We don't put something else on it. No, no. When, like when you're using castor oil, you just use it straight. You see that's really soaked in now. So can you see how it just takes a little while? And when you've finished using it, you just fold it over on itself. And then the next night you open it up and use it again. In fact, I, I would put a bit more plastic on this. You want it well covered. Yes? Iodized salt. Let me tell you something about iodized salt. As soon as you open your iodized salt packet, you've actually lost 50% of the iodine within about half an hour. So iodized salt is just three minerals now, sodium chloride, iodine, but again the iodine is lost very quickly. But Lugol's solution, you can buy from the chemist and if he doesn't have it, he'll order it for you because 50 years ago every chemist used lots of Lugol's solution. Are you familiar with betadine? Betadine is something you can buy in the chemist to put on scrapes and sores, it's just iodine. I don't, I'm not sure with Fry's balsam, but it's, um, but something that's very common in Australia is betadine, which you can put on sores, which is just iodine. Any questions? Yep. Headache. Of excellent hydrotherapy treatment for headache is putting the feet in hot water. The only time you wouldn't put feet in hot water if the person had no feeling in their feet. You see, the blood tends to um, sit in the head or get congested with a headache. And if you put your feet in a bucket of hot water, it can pull the congestion down. If we get, because we get a lot of guests on day one of Misty Mountain Health Retreat with headache from caffeine withdrawals, so we give them hot foot baths and it certainly takes the edge off. And you keep the feet in hot water for about 20 minutes. So you have a kettle nearby and you keep it hot for 20 minutes. Yes? What about insomnia? Sorry, I didn't get that next bit. Post-brain surgery with insomnia. Yeah, very difficult because the insomnia is usually caused by the brain surgery, but it, it should heal. But you can put, if someone has, brain, has had brain surgery, you could put that on the wound, the castor oil compress, and it will bring relief. And Epsom salts bath can, can relax the whole body. So there will be a bit of time. Um, I guess how long since the brain surgery? So you you look at a few things there. Yes. What about what about bunions on the feet? Uh, castor oil can help to break those down. Also, walking barefoot on the grass <laughs> and walking on the sand, getting all those muscles working, and um, also you. It's very important to get good quality shoes. Probably, uh, I spend a lot of money on good quality shoes. You've got to look after your feet because they're holding you up. <laughs> yes? Uh, what about moles? For moles, uh, you can try the castor oil. I've known people to get rid of skin cancers by putting a dab of castor oil on on every day, so you can try it. Um, there is a, a weed called milkweed, 
radium, and when you break it open, it has a white sap. That, that can also burn out a skin cancer or a, or a mole. Uh, what causes mole? Difficult to say. It can be multiple things and no one really has, uh, has said. I think probably because it can be a multiple of things. There can be a bit of inheritance there. There can be other things. So thank you for your attention tonight, ladies and gentlemen. You've done well sitting in this hot, hot night. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have a meeting from 2 till 4. 2 till 4. And tomorrow, we, um, if you're interested in buying DVDs or books, come early. We'll be here a little bit earlier. Unfortunately, at 4 o'clock, we have to jump in the car and go because we have to be at the airport at 4.30. But... Two to four, we'll be doing question and answer, but I will be having a break in the middle where you can look at DVDs and, uh, and the books. And um, probably in this session, we'll be looking at any questions that you feel have arisen in your mind that we may not quite have covered. So um, we have a few questions in the question box and um, it'll give you the opportunity to ask questions. So. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow between four and six. Did you have something to say? I'd just like to, uh, we had no break today, but just to invite you that there's still refreshments out the back, like, like we've been having the last few nights. So there's still refreshments out the back. There's, there's, um, there's water and if bits. So if you have any question, there's the, we'll get the question box out the back. Four o'clock to s no. <laughs> Delete. I'll start again. From two o'clock to four o'clock. Sorry. Yeah, it must be time to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, we have a few of those books. Now, before we go, let us close with prayer. Father in heaven, we. We thank you very much for these simple treatments. We thank you for the herbs of the, of the earth, how simple they are and yet how powerful they are. So I pray, Father, that you'll give everyone the courage to uh, try these natural treatments and also to, to ask for your help and guidance because there are many methods of healing, but there's one that God approves of and it is the natural ways that work with the healing powers of the body. Thank you for this information, Father, and we pray it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.